She's known for her smart, observational humor, which is some of my favorite kind of humor. I love that quick wit, observational humor about the craziness of life. Also, she has her legendary spontaneous wit. Paula is the star of several HBO specials, including Cats, Cops, and Stuff. Paula Poundstone goes to Harvard. Paula is a regular panelist on NPR's Comedy News Quiz, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. And she's heard on her weekly successful comedy podcast, Nobody listens to Paula Poundstone. <laughs> Don't you love that? Also an author, Paula's second book, uh, The uh, Totally Unscientific Study. <laughs> I love the title of this. The uh, Totally Unscientific uh, Study of the Search for Human Happiness was one of eight semi-finalists for the Thurber Prize for American Humor, the highest recognition of uh, the art of humor writing in the entire United States. Isn't that cool? And uh, again, that's just the, the short list of the many incredible accomplishments that uh, our very illustrious guest and our very cool guest has, uh, you know, obtained during the course of her incredible existence here on planet Earth. She, uh, the audiobook was one of five finalists in all genres for the audiobook of the year audio award as well. And she was the first female comic, uh, in its then 73rd year to perform stand up at the White House Correspondence Dinner. Do you remember that? Hilarious. Her HBO special, Cats, Cops, and Stuff, marked the first time our female comedian won Best Comedy Special. And then the fifth year of the Cable Ace Awards, Paula's awards and accolades make a long list. And she's included in innumerable documentaries and literary compendiums, noting influential comedians of our time. She is truly one of the funniest, one of the wittiest, one of the kindest. And she's just waiting to entertain uh, you know, she'll even drop by the neighbor's house and just stretch out on their vehicle if need be to make them laugh. <laughs> We're so honored to have her here. Just showing you a couple of cool shots here that we sort of dug up, showing her at her very, very best. Um, yeah, she's been doing it for a long time. She loves it. Let me show you a couple of other. This is um, a show that's happening in New York on Fire Island. If you don't know where Fire Island is, Fire Island is just south of the south shore of Long Island, New York. Uh, she's also performing at the Kate, Catherine uh, Hepburn Performing Arts Center in Sabre, Connecticut. That show is sold out. She's selling out everywhere she goes. So if you want to get tickets to the uh, tour concert event that's happening in New York on Fire Island, we'll tell you how you can do that. And of course, all the other places where she's touring. There are some of the books. There's the memoir as well. And uh, <laughs> uh, I have these and I have read them. And uh, again, they're going to make you feel real good. Uh, so I encourage you to go to her website, paulapoundstone.com and pick them up as well. So we're excited. Yeah, it's, it's a really cool night here around JMS and Lovety Hall as we have an iconic superstar comedian joining us. I see a lot of comments built up already. So that is really, really cool. Again, if you want to interact with us, subscribe to the YouTube channel and you can do that right now. Without further ado, with uh, see if you can uh, name the people that are behind her. We had their daughter on the show just a couple of weeks ago. Here is the one and only Paula Poundstone on the Gym Master Show. Paula, welcome, my friend, to the show. <laughs> hey, Jim. Thanks so much for having me. 
Oh, it's a real pleasure. And look at the icons uh, behind you. <laughs> uh, yeah, isn't that cool? Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's a bench. It's a... <laughs> It's a bench. Yeah. Lucy um, and Desi. Really, really you, nice. You know, that picture of me on the car. That is um, so cool. That was not a neighbor's car. Yeah, of that course was, not. Um, there's a, a, the, one of my books um, uh, is called The Totally Unscientific Study of the Search for Human Happiness. Yes. And it is a series of experiments doing things that I or other people thought would make you happy. And uh, um, one of you know a very American idea of happiness is a fancy sports car, and so <laughs> I rented. I thought I thought I was going to rent it for a week, but I, when I when I went on the site where you would rent the car from, it, it, there was a number there. I thought it was a serial number. <laughs> it, it, Turned out it was the price, yeah. and then I was like, "Well, okay, but you know, it's for this project that I'm doing." Say, okay, and then I was talking to the you know guy over the phone about it, the guy from the company, and I and I said, uh, "So that's for a week," and he said, "No, it's for a day." <laughs> uh, so I rented uh, that uh, Lamborghini for uh, a day. <laughs> that's incredible. I'm, I'm still paying it off, and. Uh, and I have to tell you, uh, it does not make you happy. It does not make you no, happy. No, I would say no. overall, there were a few no. sort of fun moments with it, uh, yeah. but nothing, you know, uh, you know, nothing of any. And the fun moments were probably because of the people that I was with. What you know, when I was driving it by myself, uh, maybe, you know, maybe two or three minutes of of the happy chemical, but that was it. That was uh, about so, it. So if people are trying to find a way to lift their own spirits, to feel better in the world, um, I would steer you away from a fancy sports car. I just want to know, how the heck did you balance yourself on it? That's incredible. <laughs> you know, I can plank. This is a, I'm not overall, you know, I mean, I'm fairly strong, I think, but I have a, I have a gift for planking. Um, I used to, uh, I have done occasionally on my website, paulapoundstone.com, one can find these videos that I've made, and uh, it's under RX video, I believe, uh, and I, I used to make these uh, workout videos, um, and one of the things that I would do is plank, but I, I always called it plank therapy, so while I was planking, I would just talk, and yeah. uh, I couldn't even tell you how long I did, um, but it was long. <laughs> because the hardest thing the hardest thing about planking is how bored you get yeah yeah you know? I, so I would if imagine I'm, if if i'm talking then i don't know i entertain myself <laughs> how did you know you had that skill or did somebody discover it for you <laughs> um I, it was sort of, yeah i was uh, working i used to take taekwondo and self-defense and the guy would uh, the you know one of the in the little, you know, fitness training thing that accompanies it, you know, he would have me do planks. And I think even he was like a little bit blown away by the, um, yeah. Cause I don't think you look at me and say, boy, that girl can plank, but I can. <laughs> <laughs> now, are there a lot of uses for that skill? Not really. Uh, <laughs> not, that, not that I can think of, but there it is. So grew up in New England, a Massachusetts uh, girl here. What, what, when you grew up in Massachusetts, was there a lot of humor in your household? Tell us about some of those inspirations that started to develop Paula as this iconic comedian early on. Well, you know, I tell myself that I was babysat by Lucille Ball because uh, I was the youngest member of my family. And when my mother would get, my father would go to work in the morning. And when my mother, who was a stay-at-home mom, when she would get the other kids off to school before I was old enough to go to school, she'd get the others off to school and then she would go back to bed. And so mm. I was just sort of left to wander. Um, now, in safe circumstances, you know, we weren't in the Bronx, but, uh, um, I, you know, wander around the house and wander outside. I just sort of wandered around this. And um, eventually I would make my way to the television downstairs. And uh, 
and watch uh, I Love Lucy and, uh, and The Three Stooges. And so I feel as an adult, I feel that I was babysat by Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz and, and William Frawley. <laughs> <laughs> Good old Fred Mertz, huh? <laughs> yeah, I love it. And, and uh, you know, I, uh, and, and the Three Stooges, who, by the way, I, I never liked to see them hit each other. <laughs> I always was, I always enjoyed the dialogue. Did that. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Hey, w matter of fact, you don't you have a wonderful family member that's stretched out on the floor named Mo? I do, and she is named she, a female dog. She's part. Uh, she's part. Here, I'll show you again. Make yeah, sure, there we makes go. Makes my assistant window crazy when I move this, but it's not a great view of her. Moe, Mo, Mo. There you go. That's a beautiful girl. Oh, how lovely. Um, yeah, that's my dog, Mo. She's part, uh, she's part uh, Golden Retriever and part Newfoundland. And, nice. uh, and uh, doesn't like people. So. Not a people. No, she goes against breed for that. Just goes to show you, you can't really judge. Uh, <laughs> you, can't, you can't lump, even dogs, you can't lump them all into one category. Into one category. Uh, yeah. So uh, early on, uh, what was one of those earlier breaks for you then in Massachusetts? Was it going into Boston? Uh, let's see. I, I, well, I was raised in Sudbury, Massachusetts, which is a burb uh, of Boston's. You know, it's probably an hour to 45 minutes away from uh, Boston, depending on who's driving and what time. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, as a young adult, after I was out of uh, high school, um, I lived for, I don't even know how long, but I lived in Boston, the city and happened to be there right when a, uh, you know, some people started having stand up in clubs. Um, I, it really was like a time and place thing, probably more than anything else. Um, as opposed to, uh, you know, having some great, uh, talent, I, I, I happened to be alive at a time when, uh, you know, stand-up comedy has been around since we came out of the caves, uh, maybe since before we came out of the caves, <laughs> but uh, it, it kind of ebbs and flows in terms of audience interest. And uh, that great 80s, you, you know, uh, um, uh, blast of comedy, uh, I was there at the very beginning of it. So lucky me. Yes, isn't that incredible? Who were some of the folks that uh, maybe inspired you, that you enjoyed and you admired and you followed along the way, Paula? Um, well, I I remain an enormous fan of Lily Tomlin. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I was lucky enough to uh, be, you know, still school age when um, Laughing came out. And it was such a strange variety show. Wasn't it? Uh, that, Sock it to me. Yeah. There were, you know, it was very quick cut. It was very, um, a lot of sketches, but they were fast. Yeah. And yep. uh, very little character development during the sketch. Um, right. uh, but lots of sort of fast uh, comedy, uh, a lot of it very politically oriented. Um, you know, sometimes it was no more than just a, a, a a personality or a politician literally just looking into the camera and then they would cut away. It, it was, it, it, George Slaughter was a genius creator and producer of that show. And, uh, and lots of good comedy came from there and it showcased Lily Tomlin, uh, brilliantly. Uh, so I fell in love with her very young. Um, I thought that I would grow up to be a, a comic performer, like a, a comic actress, like, yeah. like Lucille Ball or like Carol Burnett or mm -hmm. like Lily Tomlin. Um, I didn't really know from stand up, although Lily was a stand up at, at, at one time and still can do stand up comedy great. Um, but uh, yeah, I did, you know, because stand up comedy was something you would see on like The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson back then. And my parents didn't really enjoy my company well enough to have me up that late. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't really, you know, 
experienced stand-up comedy until later in my life. So you didn't get a chance to see like the Toady Fields and you know, here <laughs> the Phyllis and there, Dillers. Here and there, maybe on like a, and you know, I, I remember Toady Fields. I can't remember any specifics, but I was not, as I was growing up, I was not a Phyllis Diller fan. And then uh, for whatever reason, I, I don't even know what reason. And that one time, Fairly early on in my career, I think, I was at some event. Uh, I think I was also a performer, I believe, at this particular thing. And Phil Stiller was one of the performers. And it, ha it was the kind of event that had like round tables, people, it was some sort of, some sort of awardsy fundraisery thing of some sort. Um, and uh, so uh, if, uh, if Phil Stiller was on stage. And this crowd, as often happens when people are sitting at the round tables and they have the, you know, the rubber chicken gets served. And sometimes they're even still eating while somebody performs, which is just plain <laughs> stupid. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it was an event that was done that way. So she comes out and I mean, it's, I would say it's crickets, but what you could hear was people's forks on yeah, their plates. On the plates. And it really was just like not good. And uh, she gets out there on stage and I don't know how many minutes of not good went on mm. and she never quit. It was another joke and another joke. Unbelievable. And another joke. And yeah. I got to tell you, yeah, it was one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. She was brilliant. Yes. She was yeah. undeterred by this lack of response and she just kept kept punching away at it and eventually <laughs> it was like a dam gave way it was like the whole crowd submitted to her uh, and and it was literally like pound the table funny uh, people were crying with laughter the jokes were funny um so it, it, but it wasn't just the jokes it was you know her delivery of course but it was also just her relentless nature yeah, and uh, I became an I, I, I became a, a fan of uh, of Phil Stiller um, because boy, I couldn't have done that. I, I would have been I would have been crying after the first few minutes. I would have been I would have been like Lindsey Graham the other night in in South Carolina when she moved <laughs> off stage. <laughs> I would have been like, well, God bless America, and yeah. just walk off like he did. You know, being somebody who, and I love dry, quick-witted humor, observation of humor, and I've been an admirer of your work for, for a good long time, so it really is an honor and pleasure to have you on the show, Paula, because I know you're in your in-between-the-tour-dates time, so it's very kind of you to be here with us. Uh, I would imagine there is never a shortage of humor, especially when it's observational about the craziness and the idiosyncrasies of day-to-day -day living. Oh, I feel like I walk around with a Roomba in my head, you know, just, uh, you know, it, it, it's just a Roomba just goes around my brain, vacuuming up little experiences so that I can, uh, you know, so that I can tell them later. Um, yeah. Uh, it's a fun way to walk through the world, you know, um, because especially now, uh, it's, it just feels, everything feels so fraught that honestly, if you didn't laugh, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. There's a lot to laugh at. There's a I lot. I wouldn't even mind having less to laugh at. I, yeah, you know, I agree that you're so right because there's yeah. so many, you thought that what you saw today was as top as it can get. And then you turn on, you know, the TV, or whatever, and, and what's happening tomorrow tops the craziness of today in all categories of, uh, of existence. Oh, gosh, yeah. 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 But yeah. Did you, uh, did you admire people like George Carlin as well? Oh yes. When I was a kid, I had, uh, I think my brother actually had some George Carlin albums and uh, I memorized them. You know, I could do, I could do George Carlin's albums. I could do uh, what was the full one when, yeah. when I was yeah. a kid. Yeah. Um, didn't get me anywhere, but I could do it. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
later, you know, you know, who I stumbled into. Um, I think it was maybe on maybe on Letterman, but also even prior to that, on Saturday Night Live with the original cast. I remember they did a show one time. Maybe it was a special. It was the women of Saturday Night Live. So we're talking, you know, Lorraine Newman and Jane Curtin and Gilda um, and Bob and Ray. Yes. Radio comedy team. I think that's how I got introduced to Bob and Ray as a viewer and or a listener because uh, they were an old radio comedy team. And oh, my gosh, they're funny. And whenever I, you know, because people always say, well, who's your favorite comic? And the answer is, I don't really know because it's too hard a question. But right up there is Bob and Ray, the old comedy team. Um, and when I was a teenager, I went to a school for uh, fucked up kids, uh, like a residential program when they were like, we don't know what to do with you. And uh, I lived in a house with 16 other screwed up kids. And um, I lived in a room with like six other girls. And um, I had, uh, just before I went there, I think, um, Bob and Ray's book, Right If You Get Work, had come out. And, mm. and all it is is scripts. Right. From there, you know. And uh, I knew how they, uh, because I had heard them before, I knew how they read those scripts. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the, the tone of voice that they used. And so I would do, and, my, and the girls in where I lived didn't. I'd never heard of them. So I would read to them from that book at night. Well, they thought I was a genius um, because <laughs> they had no <laughs> idea that I was just, well, they knew that I was reading the material, but they had no idea that the delivery came from Bob and Ray. I, I've ripped people off before, never professionally. Like I've never gone on stage and done Bob and Ray stuff, but I can give you another example. For example, I, my kids weren't allowed to watch television when they were growing up. And uh, my son, what the school would say about him is that he didn't transition well, uh, uh, meaning that sort of getting him yeah. from one thing to the other was a big challenge. Getting him to school was a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> so we'd be walking to school in the morning. And I, I it's not that he didn't know he was going to school, but I did try to distract him as much as I could, because the more that he thought about the fact that he was going to school, the worse he got. Um, so one of the things that I would do is just make up stories and tell them as we were walking. And then sometimes I would just use stories that I didn't make up. For example, one day I was telling him about a group of tourists uh, that, that went on a, uh, that went on a boat for a three hour tour, a three hour tour. And the tiny ship was tossed. And he ne- he never saw Gilligan's Island and was never going to. And uh, so, so he thought I, I made that up. He, could, he, he was always trying to figure out where I was hiding my Pulitzer. Uh, I also, what was the other one I used to tell him? I used to tell him the story of the guy walking down the street with the chocolate, bumping into the guy uh, carrying the peanut butter. And that too, he just thought was brilliant. <laughs> So don't even try. I'm a pepper. You're a pepper. I would imagine, huh? Oh, I haven't gotten there yet. But now he's now he's 25 and probably wouldn't fall for it. You said something about a three-hour tour. Uh... There we go. <laughs> wow. This actually Where's... came from this came from Dreama Denver, Bob Denver's wife, who was a guest on our show three times, oh, wow. and she said, "Jim, I've got to send you the Bob Denver Gilligan bobblehead." So she did. Wow. Aloha, that, Dream of Denver. Yeah. That is that is a valuable item. It's really kind of her to do that. Yeah. We got a George Burns here, too, that my aunt collected. Uh, and Don Full of Love from Back to the Future movie and the I Jimmy Genie bottle. So TV, well, the, the, TV the, guy, the, too. Yeah. The intro to your show has yeah. a little I Dream of Genie uh, nod. Yes, it, it sure does. Yeah. So would you say that you're a kid of TV, television, very influential for you growing up? I watched probably more than I should have growing up. Um, uh, Yeah, which is probably why I wouldn't let my kids watch TV when they were growing up. Uh, Partly because I didn't want them seeing commercials. But I, 
I have to tell you that kind of backfired on me because, you know, by the time I was in probably about the second grade, if I was hanging out at my neighbor's house with their, you know, my neighbor's kids and we were, and the television was on and a commercial came on, we would all be very cynical. Like whatever they said on the commercial, you know, like how that voice would always go, collect them all. Yeah, that's right. Where, yeah, we would all go, yeah, right. We were very cynical. We had already, by the time I was in the second grade, I had already seen tons of advertising and I already knew that most of it was just bull. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and because my kids didn't experience tons of advertising, I don't think they ever figured that out. Wow. Uh, you, you, they really fall for anything. For anything. Uh, I don't know about now, but they, there were years where if they saw a billboard or if, you know, they saw like some slogan from a advertiser, they would repeat it to me as if it were, you know, fact. Um, <laughs> you know, whereas, although I did remember, okay, when I was a kid, we had a sneaker called PF Flyers. Sure. And P, PF Flyers totally hoodwinked me. Um because they used to say, and back then we got like a pair of sneakers for a year. Yes, and, and right. Generally speaking, you only had them for a year because you outgrew them. Um, sometimes they fell apart, but largely it was just because your foot kept growing. Uh, and the first car was not a BMW. <laughs> no. <laughs> but they would, PF Flyers used to say, PF Flyers makes you run faster and jump higher. And I, as soon as I got them, and I got them home, and took them out of the box and put them on my feet, I would run down the street and jump as high as I could and run as fast as I could. And I was convinced that they had, you know, <laughs> that, they, <laughs> that, the, that the slogan was accurate. I, did I ever time myself or measure my jump? No. I did they help with the planking or? <laughs> uh, no, no, I don't give them any credit for my planking at all. That's entirely me. That's entirely <laughs> Yeah, I'm. You know what? I work the road a lot, and then uh, uh, and then I have a little side gig. Uh, I'm a coffee table. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I feel good about that. <laughs> That's it. There we go. Case in point. That's really. It's really. It really is absolutely amazing. How long have you timed? How long you can stay in that position? That when that photo was taken, I was not in that position for long because I was only on one hip. And there was, <laughs> underneath me were lights. Yeah, so if I, yeah. if I fell off, there was going to be hell to pay. But <laughs> now um, I do what I call improvements uh, most evenings. Um, and I, I post, the, it, it's exercise, but I post what I do on Twitter. And uh, I, do, I do a three minute, 15 second plank. Uh, each night in addition to some other uh, improvements. And uh, yeah, it's, it's good. Do you like uh, being out on the road? Do you enjoy touring? Is that something that uh, I just do. comes? Yeah. I, I'm that's... lucky. Mm. Right. Cause some people don't even singers and other performers. They're like, Oh, that's the drag for them. But you really, you look forward to it and you enjoy it. I have the best audience in the world and I work mostly theaters a handful a handful of uh, music clubs but largely theaters and uh i get the occasional comic that will you know email me and ask if they can open for me and i don't consider myself a selfish person overall but let me tell you in this area totally selfish because the answer is no because i am not sharing my audience with anyone I do about two hours and the idea that I would have to do less so that I could have some other comic come on and do, you know, 20 minutes or whatever, forget it. I, the, the audience came to see me and I love <laughs> having them and they seem to enjoy me good enough. And I'm not, what if, and I never know, there's peaks and valleys in anybody's performance. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not, <laughs> Every second is not, you know, high octane laughs. There's it's, it's just, but I, most of my act is, um, well, 
my favorite part of the night is just talking to the audience. I do the yeah. time honored, where are you from? What do you do for a living? Mm -hmm. And in this way, little biographies of audience members emerge. And I use that from which to set my sails. Um, and so I have, you know, I have 40, how long I've been doing this. I have 44 years of material rattling around somewhere in my head. Uh, but what I'll have, I, I don't, I don't have an act per se uh, with a, it's not scripted. Um, somebody will say something in a conversation with me from the stage and it may remind me of a piece of material. Uh, and I might say that, um, but there's also the possibility that the, the, the entire conversation exchange I have with that person is, uh, is unique just to that night. Right, um, exactly. So there, it's a it's a big jumble. I always say, I always tell people, it, it, it's like that um, uh, amusement park game where you step into a booth and they blow paper money around you, and whatever you can catch, you can keep. Right. Uh, I, I, that I feel like that's how the material comes to me. Not in any organized format, but it sort of flies by. And if I can grab it, I can repeat it to that particular crowd. Um, but what if, what if I let another performer, right? What if I let another performer come in and do a 20 minute opening thing for me? And then I went on and now I only have an hour and 40. What if the best part would have been in that 20 minutes that I couldn't do because that other person was there? I'm not willing to take that risk. <laughs> you heard it here, folks. That's right. I am <laughs> when very... you go to see Paula Poundstone, you're going to see Paula Poundstone. That's, exactly. Yeah, there is no oh. even as a, even as a person that uh, occasionally goes to shows myself, not often, but sometimes. Um, you know, I always feel like I'm there to see who I'm there to see. I I, I very 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 rarely. Am I interested in in the in an opening act? I, I, except for I have to say I did see bare naked ladies at the Greek, and the violent femmes uh, middled for them. I'm going to screw up and forget the name of the opener. The opener was great, uh, and the violent femmes were fantastic. And I'd heard the name before, but I had never seen them. I wouldn't have known them if I tripped over them and I loved them. But that, that's the, that's rare. That's funny. <laughs> that is so funny. So when you got on HBO for the very first time, when you had the special, what was that feeling like for you? That had to be incredible, huh? It was great. Yeah. Um, uh, I did, I did a, HBO used to have a thing called the Young Comedian Special. Um, many of us weren't that young. Um, uh, so I had, I had done little, I had done HBO shows before where I was a part of a show and there were other performers. Um, and then I forget what year I got uh, my own hour. And uh, I did a show that was called Cats, Cops and Stuff. And... Uh, I had cause to hear it not that long ago. Um, I mean, it's not like I sit around and watch myself or listen to my stuff. Um, but I did, I was, uh, it, it got released as an album on, uh, on the internet and they broke it up into pieces. And so I was, I had, so I had for production reasons, I had to listen to the pieces, honestly, I might have seen it once since it was made, and I had forgotten uh, stuff. And I have to say, I it's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> it held up pretty good. <laughs> you know, it was. I think that we probably took out. It was not pretty good. It was fantastic. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. It was very fun to do. I. I are you hard on yourself? Are you demanding? Are you like for me when I do work on television or elsewhere, I usually don't. And a lot of people who are out there on camera, on stage, whatever, a lot of them will say they usually don't necessarily love what they just did, even though an audience 
or producers, peers love it. They're like, you nailed it. You were on the money. It was spot on. That was fantastic, whatever it is. But for you, there's you need, I guess, or I know I do, I need that emotional detachment from what I just did because there's so much invested that I'm investing in it of myself and expectation and, and I'm seeing it from this vantage point looking out. And now if I see it later on, I'm seeing it from how they saw it. Uh, so I need a little bit of an emotional detachment from the high to pull out things that I did several years ago and look at it and, and not have the attachment and say, you know what, under those conditions with that level of experience, whatever it may be, that was pretty good. <laughs> yeah. I, I, um, well, I'll tell you as a podcaster, I have a podcast called nobody listens to Paula Poundstone and it, 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 we're originally, we made it from a studio and then along came COVID and we were all, you know, had to go to our dwellings and figure out technically how to make the podcast. Uh, so I'm not even in the room with my coworkers, with the other voices on the, on the podcast, but we're hooked up via wire. Um, but the hardest thing about it and preparing any kind of material for it, or we don't generally do it's, it's material is a strong word, but you know, preparing anything for it at all. The hardest thing about it, is that you don't have an audience in front of you responding. And I use an audience like bowling with bumpers. Um, if, you know, if I'm about to go in the wrong direction comedically, <laughs> where, where other people won't be so amused, uh, that I have that reaction of the audience sort of shoving me back into the lane. And so the hard thing about podcasting is that you don't have that. So it's all guesswork. Yeah. You know, you're just like, well, maybe. Um, and there's something freeing about that in a way. And like, for example, um, I do a little bit of like voices, character stuff uh, in the podcast. I would never have had the nerve to do that in front of an audience. Never. I would just be too shy. Um, but just doing it, you know, amongst my three other coworkers, uh, it's fun. Um, and I still, if, if somebody, every now and then somebody in the audience in a live show will yell out, you know, do Mrs. Culpepper. And I, I'm like, maybe later. I <laughs> <laughs> So I don't know. It's 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 a different piece, but it is great to have. Uh, you know, it's great to have feedback. Um, exactly right. How do you like being a, a regular panelist on NPR's Comedy News Quiz? Wait, wait, don't tell me. That's such a legendary uh, program. And of course, I have been with public television for years, so I, you know, I'm very, uh, you know, a fond. Uh, fan of uh, of npr as well and of that particular program how's it for you being a part of it kind of cool a blast yeah huh? it's just a blast it's funny because when when i first went to that show uh which was i think maybe 23 years ago uh when i first started doing that show um we were not in front of an audience it was just like I just described how we're doing the podcast now, except for we weren't in our homes. We we would go to the studio nearest us. So Peter Sagal, the host, was in Chicago. Carl Sagal, who was the announcer at the time, was in Washington, D.C. at their NPR sta station. Um, uh, I was in Los Angeles. Adam was in New York. Um, so we were hooked up via wire. We had no audience in front of us. And that was just how they did it. Uh, and I forget at what point, fairly early on after I got to the show, because they'd already been on for a couple of years, I think, when I showed up. Um, fairly early on, they were asked, I think, to come do the show in front of a live audience in a theater, uh, probably in Boulder, Colorado, I would think. And um, they did. 
and they, you know, once you've drank that elixir, uh, it, it, nothing else feels right anymore. And so they were, you know, they were delighted. Um, and, and they found a home for themselves for many years. They were in the basement of a bank in downtown Chicago at the Chase, at the Chase Bank. Um, and now they're in a theater, the name of which I can't remember. But um, yeah, uh, it, it, it was a, and what was, what's great, there's a number of things that are great about Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. But one of the best things for me was, so here I am in this, you know, studio. When I say studio, you know, you're in, uh, you're in a glass booth. There's you nobody are, else yeah. in there with me. It's yeah. just me yeah. sitting in a glass booth. And, and we used to do it, we used to even do it in the morning. It wasn't even at night for heaven's sake. So, you know, I get this stupid headset on and I'm just sitting and I don't know any of the people on the show. I get introduced, you know, via wire before we begin. And, Hi. Hi. Thanks for having me. Hi. And, uh, <laughs> and then they start into something that they are familiar with uh, what it is and how it goes. And I really wasn't. And uh, so I was kind of shy. I, I, I didn't interject that much. If I was asked a direct question, I said something. But mostly I just sort of, you know. And uh, Mike Danforth, the director at the time, was in my earpiece saying, jump in anytime, say yeah. whatever you want. Right. Which I can't tell you how unheard of that is in uh, in radio or television or yeah. whatever. You right. know, I mean, people have been fooled into believing that reality TV is a thing. It isn't. It's scripted. It's just scripted badly. Uh, so, <laughs> so this idea that you could say whatever you want, whenever you want to, is was like, wow. <laughs> so much fun and it took a little while for me to figure out you know when was okay to jump in but uh again very freeing usually i'm told um don't say anything that's usually what i'm told <laughs> <laughs> how much when you put the tour together what's that like what is uh what is it like putting a show together how much of the material would you say is uh you know sort of formatted out in advance and then how much and again, it probably depends on the night, the location, the venue, the audience, the reaction, how much totally. of it is, is, totally. is very, there's ad lib very and feeding off the energy of the audience. Right. Right. That's the majority of what I do. Um, there are, I do have some jokes that I intend to get to, but I have a terrible memory. And so uh, I'm not good at memorizing. And you only called me Tim instead of Jim once, so that's not did bad. I? No, I no. didn't. Did I? No, <laughs> no, um, no, I you don't remember if you did. Tim. I definitely, <laughs> I might have, I might have actually said John, but I don't think I would. Have. <laughs> um, Tim is very specific for me, yes. uh, yeah. So sometimes, if I'm trying, if, if I've thought of something new, generally speaking, like a, a thing, a piece of material, like a new piece of material like I I, I, I I don't know like everything I say I, okay like I thought of one because uh, you know how the orcas have been attacking the yachts yeah um, and scientists don't know why um, and and then I read uh, that they are looking for Supreme Court justices <laughs> and uh, so um, all right so I have that so I go okay I want to do <laughs> the orca thing about the Supreme Court justices. So here's what I do. I take a piece of paper and I write, probably in red magic marker, yeah. I write, Orca's Supreme Court. That's all I write. That's my version of writing. And I put that piece of paper in my red folder. And that night before I go on, <laughs> I open my red folder and I see Orca's Supreme Court. And then, I, and usually in any given week, uh, I might come up with, I don't know, I would say maybe three jokes that, that I, I stir in like dry ingredients uh, to the, you know, to the egg uh, in a bowl. I can't, it wouldn't even do me any good to come up with more than that, I, and by the way, for for most performers, that's a lot of new stuff. Um, if you're if you're thinking about it weekly, 
Um, but I, if I thought of five things or six things or seven new things, I couldn't remember them anyways. So this pace works just fine. And, and so I, there would be things that I try to remember specifically to do that night because there's these new ideas that I have and I put them out there. Um, and then they are, and then they are, you know, somewhere along the way, they're coupled with, you know, something that I've been doing since 1979 and something, <laughs> something that I, you know, stuff that which, which, from last year, stories about my kids growing up, which I, I very rarely tell anymore, but um, my act is also largely autobiographical. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, when the kids were growing up, I told a lot of stories about the kids growing up. Uh, now I only do it in a sort of nostalgic way. Um, uh, do they like it? The kids? Do you have uh, to run it? Do you have to run it by them first? Or? <laughs> I, 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 I don't, you know, my, my son one day says to me, uh, I, I don't know. I guess it just dawned on him one day. He might he might have been in high school, and he said, "Mom, do you talk to do you talk about me on stage?" And I really was just caught red-handed. And I said, "Yeah." Uh, and then I said to him, "I go look. First of all, the things that the, first of all <laughs> the things I what I'm talking about is not you." What I'm talking about is the struggle to parent, the struggle for me to figure out what to do in what, you know, in whatever the circumstances with my kid are. That's, that's the point of view of it. And, uh, and I said, and the thing is, parenting is a really hard job and a really lonely job in a lot of ways. And, and to, when I say a story about us on stage, the reason people laugh is because they go, oh my God, we have that. And there's something about being able to relate to it that is so, healing's not the right word, but it's something near there. Um, you know, it just makes it feel so much better to know it's not just you, it's the nature of the beast. Right. Um, and uh, I, so I said, and then I said, and then the other thing is that I might take something that happened and then exaggerate it to make it funny. And I, I he seems satisfied with that answer. Um, so, <laughs> there. Do you think that's why you like shows like I Love Lucy? And uh, we have David Van Dusen watching right now, and he created uh, several projects uh, celebrating the Dick Van Dyke show as well. Yeah. And he said, she's a huge fan of Dick Van Dyke and the Dick, I mean, one of my I, favorites as well. Yeah. It's a, I, 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 it's a religion for me. Um, and uh, I don't know how the Supreme court's going to deal with that, but uh, it is a, it is, <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is a religion for me. I had a, I had a cat named Deacon. I was named after Richard Deacon. Richard Deacon, uh, yeah. Who was both Mel. <laughs> he was both Mel and he was Fred Rutherford from uh, Leave It to Beaver. And I also had a cat named Rutherford. And uh, wasn't he also for a period of time one of the husbands on Mothers in Law, produced yes. by Desi Arnaz? Yes. Yes, he was. Yes. Yeah. I'm trying to think of the name of the other guy. I can't remember. <laughs> Uh, and Eve Arden and Kate Ballard were in that. Yes, yeah. 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 It wasn't on very long, but we, uh, our family liked that show. Um, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, I, yeah, I believe he. I think I'm right about that. I think it was him. But have, anyways, have a chance to a, work with. He was with, a terrifically uh, funny actor. Yeah. So, do you have no, a never to... did. He was also in uh, That Darn Cat, but you know. <laughs> it was a, yeah. it was a, it was a, a Dean Jones vehicle. Of, uh, of Disney. That is funny. Do you uh, also enjoy doing voice work for animated characters? Is that something that uh, piques your interest? I've had a handful of chances to do that, and it's yeah. so much fun. Uh, you know, one of the best things about it is you don't have to dress. Uh, and I don't mean I go in naked. Uh, I mean, you know, you don't, there's, 
Well, all, I the, mean. all the things that there's fuss yeah. and muss over, you know. Um, How do they know if you and I have pants on now? I mean, this, they no they're, only, they're only seeing this part. That's exactly I mean. correct. Well, you know, <laughs> when during this during this stay at home order, I did for a period of time uh, cameos. Which yes. I would hope yeah. that I never do again. But, uh, you know, I had no income. And it was a panicky time. Happy and, birthday, uh, Bertha. <laughs> Say that again. Happy birthday, Bertha. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was a, and I didn't, listen, I love the people who are f fans of mine. I have really great fans. They're funny. You know, I, I'm on Twitter. I'm on, uh, I, I'm on Instagram. I'm, I just started a TikTok. And today I think we just started a, uh, what's the thing? What's the new one? Is it thread? Yes, yes. yes just went thread, to thread because like thank you, Elon. Yeah, we're talking for... about that on the View. Uh, Whoopi Goldberg and some of the others are on it. Yeah. Yeah. Thread. So, anyways, my point being, I have a fair amount of interaction with audience members, and I, and I can tell you that they are fun and funny, and and so you know, and the idea that anybody would want me to make a video for them is very flattering, um, and, and so so whatever. So I did, uh, and it would be. Uh, um, that that period of time for me it was 15 months that I was at home, uh, the stay at home order where the theaters were closed and I had no no income. I worked my ass off. I just had very very uh, minimal income, uh, but I worked. Uh, yeah. In fact, I had no days off. I one, one day a week I was making a um, a, a, a really goofy uh, homemade game show. Oh, I yeah. did via via Zoom. Uh, one day a week, um, I did uh, a uh, um, podcast that was the French Trump presidential press conference. Um, <laughs> I would do Trump, but I can't do a good Trump, and so I do him with a bogus French accent. <laughs> and uh, and I wrote for that, and and friends of mine did the voices of the press. Uh, I did that one day a week. I I did my own podcast on, on Tuesday. You, you get the idea. Every day was scheduled with some sort of thing that I had to do, you know, just to try to stay alive. And and then I did these, you know, um, uh, what did I just tell you the name of it was the, the videos for people thing. Oh, yeah. Called? The cameo. Cameo. Yeah. yeah. So at nighttime, after, you know, working all day long, um, at nighttime, I would come in to here. I would sit on my bench here and make these cameo videos. And uh, my dog, Mo, was about a year old at that point. And my cat, Theo, and my dog, Mo, would feel that that was their special time of night. And they would chase each other around this room. And in, in the doing of that, they would crash into the tripod that's holding the phone. <laughs> And then I would have to start over again. And it was, I was <laughs> aggravated. I was hot. Did um, that alter the content uh, as a result? I, I, I hope not. <laughs> but I, you know, I would redo it until I got it good. I can't remember at what point I found out that most people do them for like 30 seconds. I was doing like 10 minute videos. You were doing a whole set. Doing you were doing a set. Yeah. 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 yeah I was doing it. For 30 no, bucks, 30 oh, bucks, this, I'll give you a set. <laughs> all of this is to say that sometimes it was so damn hot in here <laughs> that I would put on my shirt and uh, and tie and maybe wear a hat. And uh, and then I would have shorts, uh, you know, uh, I would never, every now and then I would sort of flash someone, you know, the bottom half of me uh, just to. Um, uh, Did that cost extra? Uh, no, no, but just to, just to show that there was no pretense. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and I resisted for the longest time. I wouldn't do that because I felt yeah. like people deserved, you know, the whole nine yards. And then I'm like, you know what? Screw it. If they can't see six of the yards, then they don't get the whole nine <laughs> and yards. They don't get the whole. <laughs> oh, it was hot. The, um, you know, you've had so many wonderful experiences and opportunities and you've really grabbed them and you've, you've just really maximized it and brought so much joy and humor and and uh, got us to really think about the craziness of life for, for 
such a long time and continue to do it. What are a few of your personal favorite moments in this iconic career that stand out for you, Paula? Um, you know, there's been lots. I, I, uh, uh, let's see. Years ago, uh, I got a chance to do backstage coverage for the Emmys. And they had never done anything like that before. Uh, it was my terrific manager, Bonnie Burns, who talked, I can't think of the name of the guy, Don something, Don something used to be the, um, the producer of the Emmys. Maybe he still is, maybe he isn't, I don't know. But I remember going to a meeting. Not Kirshner. Uh, no. Yeah. I'll think of it when I don't need it. But anyways, yeah. um, she, uh, I remember going to a meeting and her pitching this idea and, uh, and the, and the idea was I would be in different locations and they would go to me throughout the show and I would do a couple, you know, a little bit of information, a couple of jokes and then toss it back. And, uh, it's a long time ago now. Um, so I go to a rehearsal the day before. And the only thing that I would do during the rehearsal, because I didn't really know what I was going to say. Um, so the only thing that I would do during the rehearsal was uh, I had a stage manager guy with me. Um, and I, would, I had decided ahead of time what locations I would be in. And I would say into the microphone during the rehearsal, can you see me if I stand here? Can you see me if I stand here? That was my whole <laughs> rehearsal, was just sort of finding the parameters of where I was and figuring out what I could do with it. So that night, that night of the Emmys, um, and Angela Lansbury was the host. And um, I'm, I'm backstage near the trophies. And, you know, now they do shots of the trophies and stuff. Um, back then they never had so all of it was this sort of you know me i was the person watching at home except for i got to be there mm. and uh so uh you know they i i had been i think i was watching for the seat fillers at one point um interviewing the seat filler for uh oh gosh a guy from uh, Night Court, John start lost, lost something was his last name. I can't, oh John, yes, yeah. John. Uh, was it John? Okay, sorry. So I done that, and it was it was off to a good start. And now I'm backstage, standing near the um, awards, and the the live audience, which is the um, you know Hollywood. And by the way. They're the worst audience in the world. <laughs> they, they are not fun because they've been there. They've done that. Yes. It's, it's all about them. Yep. They're bored. Yeah. Um, John Larroquette. Thank you. Uh, so I'm, I'm backstage, though. They can't see me. And, but then they, they put up on a screen me but i'm just on the other side of the curtain from this audience uh from this really like not fun audience and i think i even kind of made fun of them i can't remember anymore but what i remember is so and the other thing is because i didn't know what i was gonna say i didn't know like the the the, the producer the director don't know when i'm done <laughs> so what they would do is i would talk and the producer, director, the director, I guess, yeah, the director had a headset with the stage director guy that I had just with me. And that stage director guy would crawl on the floor across and pull on my pant leg when it was time for me to wrap it up. When I had like, you know, 10 seconds, 15 seconds. Good thing you so, weren't, weren't not wearing a skirt that night. He, he, yeah, yeah. He kept asking me to. Huh. Um, no, it wouldn't have been that big a thrill. Trust me. Uh, so I, I, um, I'm, you know, backstage, I'm doing my thing. 
I point out to the audience that's in the theater that I'm really just on the other side of the curtain from them. And so if they're not responding, I'm going to know. And so that, there, yeah. I, I have them. Yeah. Uh, it feels like it's going pretty good. And I'm talking into the microphone. And I see the guy start to crawl across the floor towards me. But I can hear his headset is sort of bleeding out. I can, and I can hear the director say to him, no, no, let her go. And, it, you know, in that circumstance, there was something so cool. Uh, again, in this scripted world, right? Yes. In this scripted world where, you know, everybody, every, you know, there was just something about the yeah. idea that they felt like, no, 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 we're not going to tell her when to end. That right. felt so fantastic. Yeah. And it wouldn't have been so had I not had the audience on the other side of the curtain from me. Yeah. And they are not an easy audience to uh, win to, over. Yeah. Yeah. To, 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 to grab by the back of their shirts. Um, and uh, but those are some of the moments you probably really thrive on, right? You it love was that. a great feeling. It really was. And yeah. I, and I, one time I did a fundraiser for Clinton one time and uh, it was uh, Barbara Streisand. Tom Hanks and uh, the Eagles. And so, you know, already it was, uh, you know, it was, uh, I, I was. Top shelf uh, people. Yeah. No, I, no, I was, I was like, I was full of imposter syndrome. I was like, like what the hell am I doing here? Uh, <laughs> but I, you know, same, I happened to go out and again, play, we're playing to, a, you know, rich people and celebrities. And normally there's such a shitty crowd. Um, but I happened to get them and, uh, um, it, it, whatever. And so, you know, I finished my thing and at the end of the night, Clinton goes on to, he makes his speech and then he goes on to thank everybody. And he says, uh, wasn't that Paula Pence on fire tonight? I have to say. <laughs> and then the other thing, the other, the other career highlights, I used to do a benefit for my kids elementary school. I did it for 15 years in a row. And uh, gosh, we had a good time. Yeah. 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 You know, See? just making jokes about Miss Talbot. That's it. <laughs> uh, Cullen Fields watching said, I also remember that your voice was featured on the Lois and Clark episode titled Virtually Destroyed. Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> I forget. I think I was playing like a computer villain or something. I can't remember anymore. And I also enjoyed you on the John O'Hurley version of To Tell the Truth. Oh my gosh, that was fun to do. I almost forgot about that. Sure. That was so much fun to do. My partner, Meshach Taylor, uh, who used to be on Designing Women, he was also a regular panelist on To Tell the Truth. And he and I were the, were the regulars. And then the other two slots rotated each week. And so we worked with Brian Cranston. Uh, we worked with Kermit uh, the Frog. Um, we worked with, uh, oh, come on, um, Fred Willard. Uh, many, many great people sat on the other side of me that were so much fun to be with. But me and Meshach, We'd be in makeup before. And the way we did that show was every other weekend, we taped five shows Saturday and five shows Sunday, which is a just a bear of a schedule. Um, and we by the by the end of you know Sunday, we were we were exhausted. But we used to when we were in hair and makeup, we used to sit in the chairs beside each other. And marvel that we were we were paid money to sit in chairs and laugh. Yeah. And that was pretty much it. I mean, we made one another laugh and we thought, well, that's good enough. Mm. Uh, oh, my gosh. He was fun. Uh, uh, he was really, really fun. And by the way, talk about a smart guy. Meshach Taylor knew something on yes. every topic. Yes. He, he mostly chose the right person and to tell the truth. And I mostly didn't. What I would do is, you know, say somebody came on, the premise of the show is that it, it's like a little, 
it's like a sneaky little biography of, of somebody, yeah. of somebody of interest, you know, and they can be of interest for different reasons. There was a person that had swum, I forget how many miles up the Mississippi. And, uh, that's so easy up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, 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 so you, you you know might be helpful if you knew some about the Mississippi to ask them questions. Well, I don't. Um, but <laughs> so what I would do, or or let me think. There was another part. Oh, let's see. There was a person that had written a book about how to marry a millionaire. Basically, she you know marrying finding a rich guy. It was a woman who's written a book about finding a rich guy to marry, and that this she felt this was a viable thing. She didn't feel there was anything wrong with that. She said. Um, that her mother used to tell her it's just as easy to fall in love with a rich guy as it is to fall in love with a poor guy. <laughs> poor guy. Uh, I don't know, maybe, but whatever. So these are not people that you would recognize uh, if you saw them. You wouldn't go, oh, that lady. So they go on the stage and they and they have two other people that are beside them that are imposters. And at the beginning of the of their set, they each stand up and say, you know, I'm you know, Betty Jones, who swam up the Mississippi. And then the next person says, I'm Betty Jones, who swam up the Mississippi. That's right. And the third person, I'm Betty Jones, who swam up the Mississippi. And, uh, you know, Meshach, I forget how long, we had like a minute to ask questions each or something like that. So what, what I would do is I would ask one or two questions about the Mississippi or about swimming, having no idea what the correct answer was myself. And then I would say, on the Waltons, <laughs> the episode where John Boyd loses his typewriter. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, did you think that it was the grandmother who took it or Elizabeth? <laughs> and I would pretend that that was somehow going to give me insights <laughs> yes, into the, the answer. And no matter what the, t you could be, you know, could be evil Knievel. Remember the, um, De daredevil guy that used to ride his motor oh sure By the absolutely way, yeah i don't think he was particularly good at what he did he <laughs> almost always crashed they were almost yeah and yet television viewers would turn it we would oh, watch epic event uh, evil can evil crash which is kind of mean when you think about it i met him once did years you and years ago yeah and i'll you know what he he looked like a vase that a kid had broken and tried to glue back together so his mother wouldn't notice. <laughs> like that episode of the Brady Bunch when they uh, the basketball went over the stairs and smashed the horse or the vase or something, and oh, they had to glue it together. Oh yeah, yeah, looked like. That. So that's what he looked like up close, yeah, huh? He did. He just. <laughs> he really did. He looked like you could, you could see, the seams of glue, uh, on him. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I was what my point of bringing him up. I don't know. I don't think he ever. He might have been on the show. I can't remember anymore. But it, it could have been him. It could have been anybody and any topic. And I would still use my Walton's technique when I didn't have any idea. And uh, it was as effective as anything else I could do. But my gosh, that was a fun show. You uh, had an opportunity to be a part of the. Um... Washington, the White House Correspondents Dinner, which is a whole other thing and fantastic as well. That must have been something for you, quite an honor, huh? Yeah, it was great. You know, at the point at which I did it, um, it really was, you know, the press, the press was like, the White House Correspondents were like the press in His Girl Friday. They were, uh, they were not, uh, you know, now um, it was the beginning. It was early on in CNN's cable news career. And it was really before the all the, it was before Fox News. It was yeah. before MSNBC. It was yeah. before all the very famous um, talking heads. Early 1980s, yeah. Political analysts. And so they weren't, you know, they weren't all celebrities unto themselves at that point. They really were, you know, guys with notebooks, you know, scribbling facts about, you know, from interviews. And it was, uh, you know, it was, you know, how in uh, it was all the president's men. 
Remember yeah. how Dustin Hoffman had all the little pieces of paper in his pocket, matchbooks yeah. and stuff from these interviews. Exactly. Um, and and so it did. It didn't have. It had a different feel to it than yeah. later when they started. Uh, you know, like I remember I was laying in a hotel bed one day uh, with uh, MSNBC on, and and they said, and now we're going to go to the red carpet at. Uh, at the uh, White House Correspondents' Dinner. And I was like, red carpet? <laughs> they didn't do that when I was there. Uh, it was still fun. It was still exciting. And it was still interesting. Um, but it was not, it wasn't the big deal they make of it now. Um, yeah. And by the way, lousy crowd there too. <laughs> <laughs> for the same reasons, except for at the White House Correspondents' Dinner, it was again with the damn round tables and people are eating yeah. and people, they didn't even listen to the speeches made by their people. Like right. the president of their organization talked, they paid no attention. No attention um, at all. It, yeah. Because it was all, you know, I don't know. It was all about them. Um, plus yeah. it, it's a, I think it's a weird event. I really do. It's a different sort of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, I, who was the girl a few years ago? She was, it's not that she wasn't funny because she was funny, but I just can't imagine doing the jokes that she did right beside the people that she was making them about. Uh, you know, I forget, she did stuff about, uh, oh, the terrible Arkansas governor who was at the time the press person for um, Trump. Uh, Huckabee, Sarah. Thank you. Yeah, Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Uh, and and I can't remember the name of the comic, but Sarah Huckabee Sanders was right there. And she was doing jokes about Sarah Huckabee Sanders being a softball coach and stuff. And I'm just like, okay, I do think it's funny, but I couldn't possibly do that with that person sitting right there. I just couldn't. I, I'm better at making jokes behind people's backs. Behind their backs. <laughs> You're uh, also an author, as I mentioned, too. We, you talked about uh, this book and then also this as well, sort of like a memoir. Tell us about this one. The, um, uh, this, this book right there, that the one with the white cover and the, and the pink letters is uh, uh, there's nothing in this book that I meant to say. And it is a uh, series of biographies of towering historic figures. And when I find something in it that I relate to <laughs> or something that reminds me of something about me. I jump off and talk about me, which is actually how I, every conversation that I ever have is like that. It, it, stuff reminds me of stuff. It's, well, it's not even always about me. It'll just remind something will, will remind me of something else. And I bounce off like a pinball in that direction. It's not always about me. It's often about me. Um, <laughs> I was telling, for example, let me think. Uh, one of the chapters is about Beethoven. And the information about the historic figures is genuine. I researched it. Uh, I, I didn't interview their contemporaries, but I, I read books about them. Um, so there's a, one of the chapters is about Beethoven. And uh, I was telling about an opera he wrote. And, and, then, I just, and, and then I just went from... I just stopped telling about the opera and started telling about when Oprah wanted me to come on her show. And uh, because, you know, opera, Oprah, it's close. Uh, and uh, Oprah, <laughs> Oprah, Oprah did want me to come on her show. But I swear this is true. I swear I'm not making this up. Maybe Oprah didn't even know about me. Come to think of it, maybe it was just her producers. Maybe it's just the people booking the show. But anyways, uh, I get a call from uh, an Oprah producer who wants me to come on the show and talk about women who drink alone. And uh, I was a drinker years ago. And so that's the time. Why would I want to talk about, like, yeah. and I said to the person, I said, you know, I would love to do Oprah, but. <laughs> I guess I think of myself as a comedian. And she said, well, Oprah might touch on that. <laughs> you might touch on that. <laughs> yeah. 
so I tell so as I'm as I'm talking about Beethoven, I'm talking about an opera, I stop and tell that story, and then I go back to Beethoven's opera and continue. And I do, you know, birth to death of each of the people. I do uh, uh who's in there? Helen Keller, uh, -huh. uh Charles Dickens, Abraham Lincoln, good mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. Um yeah. yeah. And uh, and that's so it's a uh it's it is a very unique memoir. Cool stuff. You got a tour that's uh, in progress here. And as I mentioned, for those that are in the Northeast, uh, one of the places is the Catherine Hepburn Performing Arts Center. We were just there. We saw Melissa Manchester and just a fabulous place. I know you love the Kate. Oh, that, is, that is absolutely sold out. But you are a mutual friend of ours. Adam Weinstock is a part of presenting this. He's a great guy. Fabulous producer. Uh, Fire Island, Long Island, New York. Tell us about this coming up on the 22nd, Saturday, 8 p.m. Yeah, Saturday, July 22nd, not too far away. A couple of ferries, a couple That's of right. plane rides, a couple of ferries, and I'll be there. Looking forward to it. Um, Cherry Grove, Ch Cherry Grove, New York. I, I, uh, and, uh, I, I've never been there before. I know it's called the Ice Palace, so I'm working on my Lutz. <laughs> will you be doing any planking uh oh my gosh maybe <laughs> you know what i do sometimes somebody posted on twitter just yesterday i think a picture of me from i think they said it was 2000 it was 2015 or 2005 i can't remember and it, it's me laying on my back on the floor with my feet up on a stool and then they have another picture from 2022 with me laying on my back on the stage with my feet up on the stool. And that wasn't what I, an X. <laughs> what I'm doing in both of those places yeah. is a foot puppet show, which ah, I occasionally do. That is cool. Occasionally, if it's a crowd I really like, I go, you yes. know what? I'm going to do for you a foot puppet show. And I, uh, I lay down on the floor and I, and I make, I, I improvise. Yeah, seems like such a lofty word right. for you know for made up. Um, I improvise a little a little puppet show using my feet, and I don't know if the person was suggesting by showing these pictures side by side that oh look, Paul Poundstone does the same thing years later. Well, <laughs> first of all, they're not the they're not the same. Um, it's an entire the subject matter of the puppet shows is entirely different from from on each occasion. But the other thing is when, when you are a gifted foot puppeteer, of course you do it. <laughs> Even though she didn't do that, Kukla friend and Ali probably would be very, very proud. <laughs> and yeah, Sherry yeah. Lewis. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't think she did. That's... I, I bumped into Sherry Lewis once years did you ago. Really? Yeah, there was a little resurgence of lamb chops yes, in there was. like the 90s. Yes, on television too, yeah. And I forget, I think I had had my son in a toy store and he was, he drooled a lot. And uh, I think he drooled on a lamb chop doll. And so I bought it because, you know, it wasn't going to put back. You All break it, you pay. <laughs> yeah. And I maybe it wasn't a great way of presenting it to but I think I then said it's one of his favorites. I think I did say that. Because I think he grabbed it off the shelf um and then drooled on it. And then I had to and uh you know what she said to me? She said, Well a puppet sale's a puppet sale. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. That's it. <laughs> you kind of you know, there was I don't know if this is an accurate um snapshot of Sherry Lewis, maybe it's not fair, but I just have this picture of like, you know, a cigar and a, you know, well, puppet sales are puppet sales. <laughs> yeah. I don't think Lamb Chop drank, but I'm not sure that but she didn't. Maybe. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, you do it uh, a lot of off the cuff responding to the audience, like you say, What if people have not been to a Paula Poundstone concert, what can they expect? Or... You just go and you find out. Yeah, I go and you find out. Um, I act as largely, as I said, autobiographical. Um, I, uh, 
I talk about trying to keep up with the news here and there. I, I talk about, uh, uh, you know, uh, taking care of a house full of animals. Uh, can't help but talk about uh, airplane travel here and there. And I know uh, yeah. everybody makes fun of comics for their airplane jokes. But, you know, in fairness, it's like a third of our lives. Yes, it um, is. And, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess those are the main things. And, and whatever comes up from when I talk to audience members, and I genuinely don't know what that will be. Why do you love doing this so much? It's not easy. It's not easy putting in the hours, the years, the myriad of things that you've had an opportunity to do and continue to do, Paula. What is it about it that speaks to uh, to your heart and soul to keep you going? What are some of those blessings and joys in your life that keep you going on? Have you ever read the book, The Jungle by Upton Sinclair? Mm-hmm. I just listened to it over the course of the last two days and it really reinforced the fact because it's the story of an immigrant uh, uh, family, immigrant family from Lithuania, I believe it was. And it was in the early 1900s. And uh, many members of the family worked in the, in, for the meat packers right. in, uh, outside of Chicago. And they were just destitute and treated horribly and had to do, uh, you know, horrible, gruesome, awful work. Uh, for, for which one got many injuries. And as I was reading this, it reminded me what a great job I have. <laughs> I have no skills. I don't know how to do anything. And so let me tell you something. Being able to tell jokes has really kept me out of meat packing. Uh, <laughs> and once you read The Jungle, and I highly recommend it, I, I listened to it. I didn't actually read it with my eyes. I listened. Uh, but, oh, my gosh, if you were on the fence about being a vegan, mm. you'll be having grass for dinner after you are. Uh, so, it, it, you know, it's a great it's it, being a stand up comic is the greatest job in the world. I get to say things that I think are funny uh, and to a crowd of people who um, often respond as if they think they're funny, too. Right. Um, yeah. And there is a, a connection there. If there's a. There's something about a live audience and, and during the stay at home order, you know, we, we lost this for the most part. Um, there is this connection that we have to one another. Um, you can go to a show and, you know, obviously not know, maybe, you know, the people that you're with one or two people or something or three or four people. Um, but you don't know the rest of the audience. Right. And yet here you are responding the same to no matter what it is, whether it's a, a movie, you know, a suspenseful movie or, or, a, or, a, or a romantic movie or a sad movie or a, or a comedy or a comedy show or a, or a rock concert. Here you are responding the same with people that you don't know. There is something about that. Yeah. That it, it makes you feel like such a part of the human race. It's 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 what I explained to my son it, uh, about why people would laugh about stories. I said to him, I go, you know, honey, if if I was telling them a story about us that was unique to us, they would just think I was a freak. They wouldn't laugh. They would be yeah. sort of put off. I go, what they're laughing about is that, oh, my gosh, we have that, too. And that feeling that we are getting through the same annoyances, struggles, um, uh, 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 and, and being able to laugh at it and about it is great. Uh, it's great for the brain. It's great for the heart. And it's great for us as a society. And, and they scientifically, they know that, you know, watching comedy improves one's mental health. I, I wouldn't, be so grandiose as to suggest that people have to come to see me for that, but you definitely need to have some of that in your life somewhere, regardless yes. of where you get it. Um, yeah. And it doesn't have to be with me, but boy, it should be somewhere. Absolutely right. It, it's, it's, it is needed and it does release those feel good endorphins and it's, yeah. It also, it's a great icebreaker. It just, and it's uh, like music, it's a universal language and it just, 
and you've been doing it so well and so beautifully so long, Paula. This well, really... thank you. I feel very lucky to have gotten to do it as long as I as I have, and uh, I have no savings, so I hope it goes on for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Get those tickets now. Right? Yes. <laughs> that is fantastic. You are truly uh, the best. And uh, I really, really am honored that you stopped by the show. And I hope that uh, you will come back again to see us. And, you know, hope it, I get to. Uh, yeah, it doesn't even have to be tied to a tour. You just want to say, say hi, you want to pop in. Um, it seems like there's a lot of mutual folks that we know, and you really are. Uh, you know, they, they use the word icon a lot, and it's a word that some people like, some people don't. But you really, anybody that does what you do and does it so well and, and does it freely in a way where you really, like you say, connect with people and get them to think about life, which is precious, which is short. If anything over the last few years has taught us, it really, really is. And to do it with humor and in a witty, observational way, it's it's a home run, but it comes naturally for you. It's really a reflection of who you are inside as a person. You're doing what you love. And when you do, people know that, that it's the real deal with Paula and you're able to, to share it and connect with people that you do. And I think it's fantastic. So hats off to you, Paula Poundstone. And really, well, thank you so much. I, uh, I really appreciate the time and, uh, Let's again get together and uh, hopefully catch you at one of these great shows. We encourage folks to get the tickets and spread the word about our show too. If you know other folks you think would like to pop by and have a, not an interview or you're in and out six seconds, tell us about the book next, but have a nice little conversation about things going on in our world and what makes, uh, makes you tick I, and why you're passionate. I think you should change the name of the show to Camping Out with Jim Masters. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Scott Schwartz would agree. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Good time. That's it. That's right. We'll make s'mores. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it was really fun. I appreciate it. Paula, the pleasure is all mine. You, uh, you be well, my friend. You take care and uh, best of everything. And let's gather again soon, okay? All right. Take care. Good luck with the tour. Thanks a lot. Cheers right. now. Bye-bye. And lovity to Paula Poundstone. Wow, what a terrific conversation. She's a wonderful conversationalist. And I love how she really takes a look at life and breaks things out in a way that's, like she said, she kept coming back to it. The relatability is what it's all about. And uh, you guys were commenting too about how much you love the bench behind her of Lucio Ball and Des Arnaz and how uncanny it is that she has that behind her because Lucio Arnaz was just a guest on our show. She's a wonderful friend of ours and of the show too. And she's going to be performing as well, uh, 54 below. She was just on uh, the show, return guest. Um, we love when we get a chance to really spend a little time with our guests. You know, you know, it's a dying art form. You don't get a chance to see a lot of that these days where, you know, you're not just talking about a specific thing, but you're really getting a, a maybe a, if you're a fan of Paula's, a, a deeper appreciation of who she is, what makes her tick, why she does what she does, why she continues doing it, uh, how she got started, some of the influences in her life. I'm sure some of the conversation uh, inspired you maybe to even go into comedy. And uh, maybe it also surprised her too, some of the things that she expressed and shared with us here on the show. Well, that's what we do here. This is an entertainment lifestyle celebrity talk show series where the guests come in from all different backgrounds. Yes, lots Hollywood friends, uh, friends from television, radio, film, and stage, friends from Broadway, and uh, not just entertainment, as you guys know, health and wellness gurus are here, and chefs of all kinds, authors, and um, folks who really just are enjoying what they're doing, and they like to have a conversation with me and with all of you. We value all of you. The Lovities watching the Gym Masters Show uh, live series where we are just inching up on almost a thousand episodes of the series as of right now. And uh, that's in just three years time. And anybody that knows anything about episodic content on television, radio, or wherever, uh, now on the internet, that is a lot of levity, a lot of shows for all of you. Hey gang, if you enjoyed this conversation and you'd like to see more of it, let us know. 
Give us a, a thumbs up like. We would absolutely love that. There is an icon that looks like a big thumb. That is specifically on the YouTube channel, which is Gym Masters TV. Click that. Leave a comment. Drop a comment. Interact with us. Let us know how much you enjoy all of these episodes, all this content, all the sensational guests, all the interactivity with our lovely viewing audience. We really appreciate that as well. We love you all. And uh, more great guests coming up. So many fabulous people that are coming up on our show. And uh, the list is long. I don't want to give it all away, but you can see who's coming up by taking a look at our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. So like, comment, subscribe. We would love that. We really appreciate as our special guest in this episode, the extraordinarily talented, gifted, and uh, breathtakingly funny and witty Paula Poundstone. Now, if you do love the comedians, we've had several on our show. Rita Rudner was a guest. She's another icon. Jeff Altman, uh, another iconic comedian, was a guest on our show as well. Check those episodes uh, out and many, many others. Um, if you love, again, the comedy elements of what we talk about, check out those episodes uh, as well. And there's many, many other fabulous uh, comedians and comedians have been with us. But Paula Poundstone, yes, she said, when you go to see her in concert, you're going to see her. <laughs> she gives 110% and then some. And um, you know what I like about her? which maybe you've only seen her, you know, in concert, in performance. Uh, what's refreshing about Paula is she's the real deal. You know what I mean? Did you get that sense? Uh, there's no airs about her. She's a straight shooter. Uh, she's funny. She's, you know, approachable. She is affable. She loves jokes, bottom line. <laughs> she loves planking. Here is the show coming up in New York on uh, Fire Island, which is the island just across the Great South Bay on Long Island's South Shore, but across from the South Shore. And uh, let me show you this as well. well. We'll bring this up for you. This is how you can get tickets to the Fire Island show. Uh, but again, move fast, whatever show you're going to, whether it is uh, New York and Fire Island, this show. And we, friend, we appreciate our friend Adam Weinstock as well. Um, or any of the shows across the country. If you go to her website, you can also see the other venues and places across the country. I would advise you get your tickets quick because she does sell out fast. She's been doing this a long time. What did she say? 44 years? And there is her uh, podcast. Uh, it's audio. Nobody listens to PaulaPoundstone.com. And uh, she grew up in Massachusetts in a great town, Sudbury, Massachusetts. And uh, she makes her home out there in beautiful Santa Monica, California. We were just talking about a, a great restaurant out there. A friend of mine, well, I was on a TV shoot out there, and a friend of mine took me out to uh, the Ivy Restaurant in Santa Monica, which was very nice, delicious, good stuff. Um, boy, I'm talking about them like they're a sponsor. <laughs> Gang, uh, we'll take a look at some of the comments here and then we'll scoot off. It's been a, uh, a terrific day. As I mentioned, we just returned literally only hours ago uh, from a, a spectacular uh, vacation and a long overdue vacation. Uh, you guys know I work in television and radio, stage and film, so the schedule is quite busy and, and uh, full during the daytime. And we were, in up in, we were up in beautiful Portland, Maine. If you've never been to Maine, it is really, really beautiful. And Portland is a fantastic city right in the area of Kittery and Bitterford and Kennebunkport, maybe some other towns you've heard of. And then we spent uh, a nice uh, good deal of time in Newport, which uh, Rhode Island, which is a personal favorite of ours. We love going to Newport, Rhode Island, the food, the people the drink, the activities, uh, the history, the nautical history. We went on a couple of sails and it was just really, really beautiful. We literally just got back a few hours ago and I had the two shows to do. Uh, if you didn't see the earlier episode of the Gym Master Show Live, we did one this afternoon. So we had two shows on tap today. We call this a double lovety day when we do that. 
And uh, the other show was celebrating the fabulous play Eisenhower. And that is uh, a play that was written by renowned playwright Richard Hellison. And the producing artistic director, uh, Peter uh, Allenstein, and of course, producer Adam Weinstock and a whole crew of people is happening uh, right now in New York City at the theater at St. Clement's and uh, is really, really fantastic. And it's about Dwight D. Eisenhower, a particular day in the life of Dwight D. Eisenhower and uh, the iconic actor, John Rubenstein from many, many television series and uh, Broadway, the original Pippin, and so much more. He is starring as Dwight D. Eisenhower. So he was on earlier, or the producers and all involved were on earlier. And we're hoping to get into the city soon. Uh, I got a personal invitation from the team to get in there and uh, check out the show. And uh, same thing with Paula Poundstone. We want to get in there and have some fun. So uh, we're going to look forward to do that. So let's take a look at some of our viewer comments. Uh, I was telling Paula that many of you, or if not many, all of you call yourselves, uh, the gym masters show Lovety squad, uh, the Loveties. It's something really special. That's only here at the gym master show. It's love and levity put together. I slipped up a couple of years ago with our show. And I said, the show has a lot of light, love and levity. And I, <laughs> I said it a little too fast, and I said, lovity, unbeknownst to me, you guys fell in love with that word, and we use that for our show. Kathleen in New York City, who's truly a JMS lovity, she says, thank you, Jim. Great show. Is that your new studio? You look great. It might be. It might be. Uh, stay tuned. Stay tuned. Everybody's loving it. They were talking about it earlier today. Thanks, Jim, as always. Love your room that you're in right now. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Mm, good stuff. And uh, let's see. Oh, David. Yeah, David was on uh, the show. Um, he was a guest twice celebrating the iconic Dick Van Dyke and Dick Van Dyke show. And he was also on with uh, Larry Matthews. Yes, who played Richie on <laughs> the iconic, one of my favorite shows and series, The Dick Van Dyke Show. And Doug Denoff, too, whose dad Sam Denoff was uh, one of the head writers of the Dick Van Dyke Show. So David was with us. Thank you very much for the kind words, David. And I hope you are doing well. And uh, Merlin in Canada says, hey, Paula, you have been a riot. Thanks for being here. Thank you as well for those kind words. And uh, Cheyenne Smith says, and it's good to see you as well, Cheyenne. Welcome. Paula is so funny. Her humor is much appreciated. It really, really is. Yes, she is definitely a lovely, uh, for sure. I agree, gang. And uh, Eric Levitt is here. Good to see you, Eric. And Eric says, it's nice to meet you, Paula. We'll leave the light on for you. From Culver City, California, SoCal, in the L.A. area. And you guys are terrific. Thanks for all these great comments just pouring in here. Lots of our, what I'm looking at are the comments that came in in our Lovety Hall exclusive chat room, which you can comment in when the shows are on and uh, live. And you can, um, when you subscribe to our channel, you can definitely comment. But don't forget, you can also uh, comment on our YouTube channel under all the episodes. So do drop a comment, leave a comment for us if you enjoyed this episode with my special guest, Paula Poundstone. Uh, absolutely, you can uh, definitely do that. And uh, Jane says, uh, this has been a great fun show. Thank you, Paula, for being here tonight. Thank you, Jim. Time to relax. Yes, it is time to relax. We've got so many amazing guests that are coming up this week and every day, working very, very hard behind the scenes to bring you not just any typical content that's out there, not just a typical interview show, but an entertainment lifestyle celebrity talk show series that harkens back to the old school way of doing talk shows uh, where the guests, you guys, the viewers, you are pretty much like our international studio audience. And when you comment, you get a chance to comment. It's kind of like you're clapping. When you leave a like, comment, subscribe to the channel, it's like you're clapping for what we're doing here. So we appreciate that. And uh, our guests have so much, you know, a lot of times I may know the guest in advance 
Uh, maybe I've interviewed them on television or on the radio professionally, PBS or elsewhere, other networks, other shows and things that I've done over the years. And they want to come on the Jim Masters show. Some I've met for the very first time and then we become friends and they want to come back on the show. We treat all our guests with great respect and care as we love to do for all of you and you and you, our terrific audience. Kathleen says, uh, have a great night, eat and relax. Thank you very much. Jane watching in Sweden. This has been a great fun show. Thank you, Paula, for being here tonight. Thank you, Jim. Time to relax. I appreciate that. You guys are wonderful. Uh, Kathleen says, uh, Jim, you are fantastic with two, uh, with a heart and a kiss. Thank you very much. Right back at you. The queen of Queens, New York, Kathleen and everybody else. I know there's some folks who have been saying that they've been a fan of Paula Poundstones for decades and you've loved her being here on the show. And, uh, yeah, I know we've lost a lot of, uh, you know, Bob Saget and of course, Louis Anderson and Meshach Taylor, so many credible, talented people as well. And, uh, <laughs> Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't see this. Uh, but uh, I'll ask about it after ask her about Dick Van Dyke attending her yearly ping pong tournament. Yes, I know she's big into ping pong. You know, a lot of people are also big into pickleball now too. Have you ever played pickleball? I play tennis, but, uh, I'm getting into pickleball and there's so many people that are getting into pickleball. Um, uh, Pam. Yes. Pam said, great show, Jim and Paul. I've been a fan of Paula since the 1970s. That is dedication. Cullen Fields says, Jim Masters, bringing back the art of conversation. Thank you very much. PaulaPoundstone.com is the website. If you want to get her merchandise, she's got shirts and she's got books and audiobooks, CDs and all kinds of cool things. So you can check it all out, folks, at uh, paulapoundstone.com. Again, there's the show that's coming up. And, um, yeah, cool stuff. This was a lot of fun. I hope you guys enjoyed it as well. Don't need this anymore. I only have that in so I can hear the guests when they're speaking. But uh, one more time, we thank our very special guest, Paula Poundstone, for being here. So you guys know the drill. If you're regulars, viewers of our show, we don't say goodbye around here. We say see you later. Ciao. Cheers here live on the Gym Masters show. Thanks for spreading the word. It would be really great if you can spread the word and uh, share the episodes on your social media. Find me on uh, social media at uh, Gym Masters TV on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Of course, Paula Poundstone is on all social media as well. She's also on TikTok. And just think about her planking. <laughs> uh, this might be one of those things, don't try this at home. <laughs> And uh, maybe you've heard of planking, but you were not sure what it is. Uh, you've heard of walk the plank. And uh, again, anyway, this was, a, this was a lot of fun. We really appreciate it. She really is truly uh, an American institution uh, and a fantastic, fantastic person. And guess what? You got a chance to sample her and hear from her right here on the Gym Master Show live series. All right, gang. So that's about it. Um, you know, we could keep going, but let's, let's save some material for our next episode. Okay. <laughs> you guys are great. Thanks for all the comments. Again, if you love this episode, like, comment, subscribe, we will see you on the next one. Uh, we don't say goodbye around here. We say, see you later. Ciao. Cheers. Slancha. Hasta la vista. Avita Zain. We say, Moy Loop, take care, be well, cheerio, shalom, sayonara. Did I say slancha already? The Irish toast, slancha. And uh, take care, be well. We love you all. Thanks for being with us in this episode of the Gym Master Show Live. If this was your first time stopping by our iconic series where there's almost a thousand episodes that you can binge watch, see some of the past episodes. They're all saved for you and archived. They're archived on our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV as well. So uh, check them all out. Uh, if this is your first time here, come back and see us again. And if you're a regular viewer, we'll see you again. We love having you here. All right. <sighs> I'm hungry. Now I want a sandwich. <laughs> we did eat well when we were on vacation, but uh, we didn't have to make the sandwiches. Now we have to make those sandwiches. All right, gang, you guys be well. Take care. Love you all. I think we've covered it all. 
And uh, mm, this was a lot of fun. They're always, when you see me looking down, I'm looking at comments that are still coming in here to uh, the Gym Master Show. That's a wrap. See you on the next one. Uh, spread, share, like, love. And uh, we'll see you on the next episode of the Gym Master Show Live. Be well, gang. Cheers. <laughs>